With energy prices at an all-time high, many people are switching to cold water aquariums. In this video, I want to share some tips and tricks I've learned from my own experience with cold water tanks. The term cold water tank is commonly used in the hobby, but it can be somewhat misleading, so I want to clarify. In this video, I'm referring to room temperature aquariums kept in a modern home with central heating and insulation. Although the average outdoor temperature in my city was 4.4 degrees Celsius or 39.9 degrees Fahrenheit in January, my fish room is around 18 degrees Celsius or 64 degrees Fahrenheit. This places these fish in the temperate category between tropical fish and true cold water fish, but most people simply use the term cold water fish. At the time of recording, I have gold white cloud mountain minnows, celestial pearl danios, rice fish, neocaridina shrimp, pink ram's horn snails and zebra danios in my room temperature tanks. Since most fish rooms stay well above 10 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit, the point at which species like goldfish and koi may enter torpor or semi-hibernation state, we need to treat these temperate fish a bit differently than true cold water fish. The first tip is to reduce feeding during the colder months. As water temperatures drop, the biochemical processes in fish slow down and although they won't enter a semi-hibernation state, this does lead to a lower metabolic rate. This means they become less active and burn fewer calories daily with this being normal and expected in colder water. Feeding less not only helps prevent unnecessary weight gain but also reduces the amount of waste produced. Less waste results in lower ammonia levels, keeping the tank safer during colder periods. In my fish room in the north of England, temperatures peak at around 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer and I've noticed a clear difference in fish activity in my room temperature tanks across this temperature range. Unfortunately, there's no universal rule for how much to reduce feeding so some trial and error is necessary. Personally, I feed about two-thirds of what I offer during the warmer months and I haven't experienced any ammonia spikes. The next suggestion is to use a fish food with a lower protein content than usual. To be clear, I haven't personally tried this yet because it's hard to find high quality, low protein fish food in my area. In my fish room, I typically use Fluval Bug Bites and NT Labs products. Until recently, both only offered regular tropical formulas, but NT Labs just released their temperate granules, which have a lower protein content. Although I haven't faced any ammonia issues this winter or last, I plan to switch to these granules next winter. One key reason is that a significant amount of ammonia in aquariums can come from ammonia excreted through the fish's gills when digesting high protein foods. Some sources even suggest this might be the primary source of ammonia in certain setups. Beyond reducing ammonia, there are also theories that lowering the protein content of fish diets during colder months can benefit their overall health and ease the burden on their liver. The next tip is to keep a close eye on nitrite levels as colder temperatures can pose a major challenge for the nitrogen cycle. Many aquarists focus on ammonia levels, but most aquariums can handle ammonia conversion in cooler water because ammonia oxidizing archaea rather than bacteria do most of that work and they remain effective at lower temperatures. The real trouble arises when it comes to converting toxic nitrite into nitrate, a process mainly carried out by Nitrobacter and Nitrospira. Nitrobacter prefers water temperatures of 25 to 28 degrees Celsius or 77 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit, while Nitrospira does best above 29 degrees Celsius or 84 degrees Fahrenheit, both well above typical room temperature tanks during winter. Although these bacteria will still convert nitrite at lower temperatures, their efficiency drops which can lead to sudden nitrite spikes. Essentially, many of the microorganisms that handle ammonia still do their job in cooler weather while those that handle nitrite slow down, potentially causing levels to rise unexpectedly. The next tip is to expect algae growth in your tank and consider letting it grow until the warmer months arrive. As mentioned earlier, the microorganisms responsible for the nitrogen cycle can struggle in cooler water, which can lead to excess nutrients and, in turn, increased algae growth. Some pond keepers use this approach, arguing that plant and microorganism activity slows in cooler weather, causing nutrient levels to rise. 
Certain types of algae can grow at these temperatures and act as a nutrient sponge, preventing toxic compounds from accumulating too quickly. I tested this theory over the winter, which is why you may spot algae on some of the glass and plants in these clips. I'm unlikely to repeat this experiment as there wasn't much algae growth in the tank suggesting there wasn't many nutrient spikes. Still, depending on your setup, leaving the algae in place might be worth it when trying to keep your fish safe. The next tip is to choose livestock and plants that are better suited for cooler water temperatures. It might seem obvious, but it's a common area where people go wrong. I only like to recommend species I've personally kept, so these aren't exhaustive lists. In my room temperature tanks, I keep gold white cloud mountain minnows, celestial pearl danios, rice fish, neocaridina shrimp, pink ram's horn snails, and zebra danios. I have so many plants that it's easier to just show them on the screen so you can pause and take a closer look. Most of them essentially stopped growing in the colder months, but they didn't melt and they do seem to be growing again as things slowly get warmer. I want to quickly show my unfiltered Wallstad Pearlweed Jungle Tank as this thing didn't get the memo that it's called. As you can see, the pearlweed is pearling, showing that it's photosynthesizing so fast that the water can't dissolve the oxygen causing bubbles to form and its growth rate doesn't seem to have changed since summer. Other standout plants include Rotala rotundifolia, Hygrophila polysperma, Helanthium tenellum green, Litterella uniflora, Dwarf sagittaria, duckweed and water lettuce, although their growth rates have slowed to about half of what they are in warmer months. If you're planning an unheated Wallstad method aquarium, I highly recommend including these plants for natural water purification to make sure the plants can handle the bio load during the winter. The next tip is to cycle your aquarium during the warmer months if possible as it drastically speeds up the process. I recently set up these two Wallstad tanks and one inert tank and each took about twice as long to cycle as I would normally expect. I'm also cycling an under gravel filter tank right now and it's currently at the stage where in summer it would already be considered cycled but it still needs a couple more weeks to be completely safe. For anyone that doesn't know, different varieties of nitrifying bacteria have very different optimal temperatures and pH levels to each other. That's why bacteria in a bottle products like Fritzzyme 7 have recommended water parameters to try and ensure you get the best performance from the product. Another benefit of cycling in warmer months is that it makes it easier to ship livestock. Neo Caridina shrimp would probably be fine at the current temperature, but I just want to wait another month before ordering them, so I'm holding the cycle on these tanks using ram's horn snails. Anyway guys, that brings the video to an end. I know everyone has their own preferences when it comes to fish and many tropical species aren't suitable for colder tanks, but a cold water setup can be a fantastic option for many people. I hope you found this video helpful. Thanks for watching and have a great day.